السلام علیکم کیا حال ہے گڈ گڈ یو گیس کین جسٹ اسٹینڈ رائٹ اوور ہیئر دین آئی ول اسٹینڈ ہیئر دین آئی جسٹ یا رائٹ دیئر بائی دا اسمال بوائے یا اور رائٹ سو ویلکم سو وٹ یو سی بہائنڈ می دیٹس لائک دا مین پریئر ایریا فار دا مین ویمین پرے اپ اسٹیٹس سو وین دا ٹائم ول کم فار اپراکسیمیٹلی ون ٹین دا لیڈیز ول ٹیک بوت آف یو اپ اسٹیٹس دیر رائٹ اور رائٹ سو وٹ یو سی دیئر از یو کین سی دا مین دے آر گیٹنگ ریڈی فار دا پریئر سو وین وی پرے وی لائن اپ ایز یو کین سی دا مارکنگس آن دا کارپیٹ پیپل کم اینڈ فرام دا فرنٹ ٹو دا بیک پیپل لائن اپ اینڈ وی پرے شولڈر ٹو شولڈر So before people come here, they already do the vadu, which is to clean themselves. So as we are standing in front of God, we have to be spiritually clean, psychologically, physically, right? So all of us, some people, they, so be in the basement, we have the special uh, basins where people wash themselves. But most of us, we do, we do that at home before coming. So we don't have to go down and do it again. The second important thing is, uh, you may see in that there are no symbols. So Islam is a symbol-less faith. So we don't have any depiction of God or of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or any saint, any messenger. When we pray to God, we pray to God directly without any mediator. Because one of the attributes of God, very similar to the Bible, is that God is all-knowing, He's all-hearing. So He knows what's in our heart and mind. So for that reason, we don't go through any person or any prophet or any saint. So we pray, how many times do you think we pray? So we pray five times a day. So the very first prayer is before sunrise. The second prayer is early afternoon, which is now. The third prayer is late afternoon. And the fourth one is right after sunset. And the fifth one, like when it becomes dark. So these are all the periods of prayer, right? The time slots. So during the, those time slots, every mosque they decide, okay, what time within the time slot, we should have like a congregational prayer. So people would know they can come here. So praying here in the mosque has like 27 more reward compared to praying at home, especially for the men. So for that reason, especially on the weekends or at uh, evening or night time, uh, people, they come here. Some people who have homes like very close by, they walk here. Some people, they drive here, right? And the kids also, they join us like later on uh, and they pray. So how is the Muslim prayer? So we pray in the Arabic language. So of the five daily prayers, three of them are audible. Uh, this one is, uh, it so happened, it, it will be a silent prayer. So the second and the third prayer are silent. And the first, fourth and fifth prayer are audible. Audible means the Imam who is going to lead the prayer, he will stand in the front and then he will recite certain passages of the Quran, the very first uh, chapter and some passages of the Quran. So everyone can hear it, like the whole building can hear it technically. When we change the motions of prayer, so when we pray, we are facing the direction of uh, which direction that we pray to? Towards Mecca. Towards Mecca, right? So every mosque is built in the direction of the Mecca. So this mosque is built from the scratch. But some mosque, obviously, if uh, Mecca is facing that way, so they have to have all the lines and the carpets like diagonal, so face that way, right? So we say Allahu Akbar, means Allah is the greatest, and we fold our hands. And then we recite the very first chapter of the Quran, and a few other uh, passages from the Quran, then we bow down. As you can see, the kids are bowing down and then they are going to prostrate, right? So in the bowing down and in the prostration, there are certain <laughs> ways that we thank God and then we glorify God. So from the time that we say Allahu Akbar and fold hands and all the way to uh, prostration, that is one unit. So every prayer of the five daily prayers, they have certain number of units. So the very first morning prayer has two units. So we'll, we will repeat that two times. From the time we are standing up, and all the way to prostration, we get up again and we repeat the same thing two times, right? So that's how the morning prayer. Some uh, prayers have three times or three units. Some has four units. So in this prayer, it would be four units because you may be just observing and thinking, okay, how many times are they going to go up and down, right? Four times. 
So that's how a typical prayer is. Any question, comment, what you observe? So what they're doing right now, these are the optional prayers. You know, just like in schools and colleges, you have uh, bonus assignments, right? <laughs> Extra points, you know, brownie points. Exactly the similar way. So they are obligatory, uh, you know, prayer. And then there's an optional prayer for more reward. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, also used to do extra prayers. So we want to follow that uh, so we can get extra reward from God. Question, comments, any observation from Dr. Johnson or any one of you? So one of the things that he said is people stand shoulder to shoulder. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about how does that engage with Hinduism? As far as shoulder to shoulder, everyone is shoulder to shoulder. Right. I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. So, so how, how does that solve a problem that Hinduism was, was bringing before people? Uh, by connecting all of us together? Yes, caste system divided people, whereas right. in Islam, mm -hmm. no matter who you are, you're right. standing shoulder to shoulder with someone else. Mm -hmm. So that's so. important. Uh, so anyone who comes in, doesn't matter the richest person, the poorest, doesn't matter caste, nationality, status, I would not know who would be standing next to me, right? It can be the Bill Gates or the Andrew Tate or anyone else, correct? <laughs> Could be standing, doesn't matter. When we come to pray, we are all equal in front of God. We are all humans and as humans, we are all equal. So that erases the, the mentality that I'm superior, I'm inferior because of certain caste and certain um, family that I'm born into. So Islam solves that problem. You'll probably have more questions. We, we, we probably will afterwards. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. As you observe it, uh, then when we go back to the classroom, then I can elaborate more about the prayer, uh, maybe from a comparative religion point of view. All right? God willing, inshallah. All right? So we are so conscious. Before every prayer, what happens is... Uh, we have a call for prayer. Uh, like in the Muslim countries, uh, you were born and raised in India? Mm -hmm. So in the Muslim countries, even in India, so I was also born and raised in India, Hyderabad. Yeah, where you can hear. You can hear because of the zoning laws in this country, you cannot have the speaker going outside. People would be like shocked, you know, 5 a.m. in the morning, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So in the Muslim countries, we have the call for prayer to let people know that prayer is about to start, finish off your work. You know, prepare yourself, come to the mosque. So, they do it inside the mosque. So what we can do now is, the ladies can go, the ladies can go upstairs. You can take the elevator or you can take uh, the stairs, it's up, it's up to you. Because we are going to start in 53 seconds, <laughs> all right? There's, there's a timer up there running. <laughs> no, just walk safely. What you can do is, uh, yeah, you can uh, take off your shoes and you can come inside. Okay. Yes, you. you can. They, they can uh, share from their experience. These are your kids? Yeah, yeah, Yusuf. Oh, Yusuf. Say salam to uncle. Yeah. He's saying assalamu alaikum to you. Okay, I start in the name of God, the most beneficent and the most merciful and welcome each single one of you to our uh, Muslim Education Center. You know, it's really awesome that all of you are able to make it because nowadays people are so oblivious to, uh, well, welcome, we have more people, mashallah. <laughs> we just uh, came from witnessing the prayer. So I would like to give you the first opportunity to ask any questions or any comments based upon what you observed in the prayer. In the prayer room, right, that we call as the masjid or the mosque, and the way Muslims are praying, or the way, you know, anything that you observe, now is the time. Initially, we can go with that. Then I will come to some basic concepts and some history of Islam, history of the Quran. So go for it. What do you think that you observed in the prayer? Yes, ma'am. Um, is there a difference between when people just bowed like at the at like the hips or when they like went down onto the ground like on their knees? Okay, so the question is, is there a difference? Uh, what do we say when we are bowing down compared to when we are prostrating, right? Mm -hmm. 
So we, we have different ways to glorify God in different motions, in different actions of the prayer. So it's important for us to know the way that we are praying. We did not make up the prayer. This way was coming from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he was taught by Angel Gabriel and Angel Gabriel was taught by none other than God. So we say the way that we are praying, that we are following Muhammad, peace be upon him, exactly the timings that he used to pray, how he used to prepare for the prayer, right? And the direction that he used to pray and the, what recitation that he used to have and, and the, what uh, different actions in the prayer. So every single action uh, has certain significance to it. Uh, and we say that uh, ultimately prayer is to thank God and to seek God's help and to glorify the, uh, uh, you know, the Almighty Creator. One footnote about the prayer is this, that all the prophets and all the messengers, they used to pray in a similar way. What is my evidence for it? My evidence is the Old Testament and the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, uh, in the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verse number 3, when a good news came to Abraham, the very first thing that he did was, he prostrated himself to thank God and to pray to God. And that's exactly the way that we prostrate. When it comes to Moses and Aaron and, and their family, it says in the book of Numbers, chapter 20, verse number 6, that they perform ablution, means they wash themselves, and they went to the prayer uh, place, and then they prayed. And it says they also prostrated when they prayed. So we take Jesus to be as a mighty prophet, and he prayed in a similar way. What is the evidence? This is uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, the first Gospel, chapter 26, verse number 39. You know, when people were coming after him, so he went to the garden. Okay, what is the name of that garden he went to? Eden. No, <laughs> it's not Eden. Eden is attached with uh, Adam, right? One, one other garden starts with the letter G. And nobody Googles now, right? <laughs> yes, go ahead, you. Oh, no, I was, uh, I didn't, I was in Google. <laughs> okay, okay. It's called as, uh, you want to give a short, Sorry? Dr. Johnson? We have seen pictures of the Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I went there. Do you guys know that? I went there. That is good. To the act actual garden, I went there. It has a depiction of Jesus, right? And he's actually praying. So this is in by Jerusalem. So it says in uh, Matthew 26, 39, when the people were after him, he went to the garden of Gethsemane and he prostrated himself and he said that, Oh God, take this cup of death away from me, not my will, but your will. So we Muslims, we say we are followers of every prophet, every messenger. The way that they used to dress themselves, right? Uh, especially every prophet used to have a beard. When they used to uh, greet their disciples, they used to say assalamu alaikum in the Aramaic language and maybe in the Hebrew language, uh, which is also documented in uh, the Bible. John chapter 20, verse number 19, when Jesus, when he went to the upper chamber, the very first thing he mentioned to the disciples is peace be upon you. And you may have seen that Muslims, when we meet, that's how we greet. Every prophet, they used to fast the way that we are fasting now. Uh, prophets, they were circumcised. But the biggest thing that we say we are following every prophet is that all, all of them, they were monotheistic believers. Anything else about the prayer? Why do, you, why do you take off your shoes before you walk in? Okay, why do we take off the shoes? Any other follow up with that? Or? Yeah, so the reason is that we pray on a carpet, right? And uh, suppose if I walk with the shoes inside the carpet, it is going to dirty the carpet, especially because we are prostrating, right? Our putting our face and the nose and the forehead. I mean, right now it's okay, but suppose it's like snow and sleet and, you know, mud and all of that, and people walk in and come in the carpet, the carpet will become bad. We have to, you know, clean the carpet every day, maybe, maybe five times a day. So just for the practical reason for it. Now, it's important <laughs> that prayer doesn't have to be on a carpet. The clothes have to be clean, right? Our heart and mind has to be clean. Uh, the place has to be clean. Technically, we can pray like on a on the on the concrete. So as long as the place is clean, we can pray. And you know, carpet looks good. It looks like more you know better <laughs> when we pray on it. 
for that reason. So for that reason, we take off our shoes. All right, so what we can do, Professor, is I will just briefly go over some of the basic fundamentals. And so have all of you studied the chapter on Islam in your book? You have. You can take the mic. <laughs> right? No? No, come on. <laughs> all right. Just to make it easy, right? It's OMG. Okay. And the O stands for one God. So Islam is an absolute monotheistic faith. That means we don't believe in multiple persons in God, multiple gods, uh, idols, right? Or worshipping humans, animals, any part of the creation. We say that we worship the one creator, right? So the O stands for uh, one God. So there are many, many references uh, regarding one God in the Quran. So we have uh, maybe five, oh, maybe we have six youth in there, right? So what I would request them is uh, maybe one of them can come and recite one short passage of the Quran that speaks about the oneness of God. Who wants to volunteer? Guys, they're all pointing fingers as the bigger boy here. Okay, Hosefa, you can come in. Surah Al-Ikhlas with the translation, all right? So, okay, I will give you the translation, okay? <laughs> so, Hudayfa, mashallah, he's a, he's, he just uh, started going to Northeastern, correct? Yeah. And the special thing about Hudayfa is that he memorized the whole Quran from the first page to the last page, right? And he recites the Quran. Sometimes he leads the prayer in many places. So, if you can please recite for us Surah Ikhlas. What's he called? Remember we talked about Go that? ahead, you can say. What's he called when he memorized the whole Quran? Ahafiz. Ahafiz. Which means protector. How old were you when you recited the whole Quran? When I like memorized it? Yes. Um, I started in fourth grade, so eighth grade, so four years. Wow. So four years? Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. How many Hafizes right. are there in this, uh, um, this masjid? In this one? Yeah. Um, so they, they have a program here, and I think um, it's been going on for about 8 to 10 years, I think. Um, okay. I think they have about maybe 20, 20, I think. I would say maybe close to 50, because some people, they graduated, they moved out. Mm -hmm. You know, every like 2-3 months, there is an announcement made in the mosque that we have one more person, one more youth, who finished the whole memorization. Mm -hmm. Yes, sometimes 2, sometimes 3, right? So I would say approximately in the last uh, eight years, maybe 50 people graduated. Wow. And this is only one mosque over here. Just remember, there are 3,000 mosques in the whole USA. Multiply that by 50. Mm -hmm. All right? And this is just a country in which Muslims are only 1%. Mm -hmm. There is a school in Pakistan, one madrasa. They recently graduated one millionth hafiz. Yes. So in the whole world, approximately about 15 million plus and counting memorizers. Mm. Thank so, you. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so I'll do, um, it's one of the shorter chapters. Um, so that was one of the shorter chapters. Longer chapters, they have like 286 verses in there. So this one has about four verses, right? Four verses in there. So the translation is this. See, we are speaking about the oneness of God. Uh, that is the third last chapter. There are, there are two more after that, yeah. So usually the way the Quran is uh, arranged, I will come later on to the history of the Quran, is that uh, usually the longer chapters are in the beginning of the Quran and the shorter chapters are towards the end. So it has 114 chapters and that chapter is 112th chapter, right? Almost towards the end. So here is the translation of it. Say, Allah is one and only. He is eternal, He is needed by all. He begets not nor His begotten and there is none like unto Him. So what the chapter, so this chapter, there is a context to this chapter. There was a delegation of the Christian pastors who came from Najran in the 7th century in the year 631. And they knocked at the door of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And they said, you know, we came to find out more about you. Our king sent us to you to find out who are you. You are proclaiming oneness of God. 
tell us more about God. So he invited uh, these 16 pastors to the mosque. And they stayed there for three days and three nights. And he served them the food, right? Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, they slept in the mosque. They had long discussions in the mosque. And then the time for prayer came for the Christians. They said, can we go outside and pray? The Prophet said, pray right here in the mosque. Inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. So during their discussion, Dr. Johnson, they asked the question of our Christian friends, you know, oh Muhammad, peace be upon him, what is the concept of God that you preach? At that time, this passage came, or this uh, surah, this chapter came from God to Muhammad, peace be upon him. So in the context of the belief of the Christians, God in the <laughs> Quran is introducing monotheism. Because our Christian friends, they believe in a triune concept. So God is saying that, say, he is Allah, he is one and only. Our Christian friends, they ascribe Jesus to be as, uh, you know, eternal and uh, God, son of God, divine. So God is saying in the second passage of this chapter, that God only is the one who is eternal and he is the one who is needed by all. And they, that uh, he begets not, nor he is begotten. And there is none like unto God. All right, so therefore, good job, man. <laughs> Very good, mashallah. All right, so that's the oneness of God. So what we say is that this oneness of God was coming all the way from Prophet Adam up until our time. So what I will do is, I'm going to go back and forth over here, right? So we say Allah. Have you guys heard the word Allah before? So when we say the word Allah, we are not worshipping a different God. We say that in different languages, there are different names for God. Like for example, in the Hebrew language, what is the name for God? Yahweh, Yahweh Jehovah, Elohim specially, right? Or some people may say uh, Adonai, right? Mm -hmm. So this could all, all of these, they signify the same creator. <coughs> okay, what was the language of Jesus? It was not English, all right? Not Spanish. What was his language? Hebrew. Hebrew. No, uh, Greek. No, no. Definitely not Greek. <laughs> not Hebrew. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, this language was his language. Starts with the letter A for apple. But the Mansur, your turn. Aramaic. There you go. Aramaic language. So that was his language. In that language, the name for God is Ilah or Allah, very close to the word Allah. In Spanish, it is Dios. In Norwegian, it is good, right? Not good, it is good. <laughs> I just uh, googled it. That's what they say, the way that they pronounce it. And in Arabic, it is Allah. So when we say the word Allah, we are not worshipping a different God, the same creator in different languages. So we say that Allah has many different attributes. One of the attributes of God is that He is all-knowing, He is all-powerful, He is one, He is merciful, forgiving, loving creator, and He wants to guide humanity. So Islam says that for God to, for God to guide humanity, God did not came down and became a human. He remained God and He appointed messengers and prophets from the humans. So the very first prophet, that God appointed was the very first man, Adam. And this is the historical timeline. So these are all the different prophets, right? So Adam was the very first one. Then you have uh, Noah, you have Abraham. I'm skipping many, many. Uh, you have uh, Moses, right? David. You have Jesus, and who do you think Muslims consider as the last and the final prophet? Starts with the letter M. Yes, Prophet Muhammad, right? Peace be upon him and peace be upon all the prophets. All right, so what we say is that all of these messengers and prophets, they were not given different faiths. According to the Islamic theology, <laughs> they all were given one fundamental truth, which is, Go and tell your people, submission to God. So there is a passage in the Quran, chapter 16, verse number 30, uh, chapter 16, verse number 36, in which God is saying that I appointed messengers and prophets to all the nations and their main fundamental teaching is that 
submission to God. Go and tell your people not to worship humans and idols and animals, but humans should submit only to the one creator. So now is a quiz question to you. The concept of submission to one God in Arabic is what? So one word in Arabic signifies this concept of submission to one God. What is that Arabic word? I'm 100% sure it is there in your book. All right. <laughs> and the professor is looking at all of you. Come on, guys. What if I give them a hint? What's the first letter? I. I. Second letter. Sorry. See? Yeah, okay. Say it, say it. You know it. Islam. Right? The name of the faith. So what we say is that Islam, it means submission to one God. And all the prophets and all the messengers, they were given the message of Islam. You know, sometimes people may think, you know what, Islam is a new faith. But what we say is that Adam was given the guidance of Islam. So were all the prophets and all the messengers. So what happened according to Islam is that, according to the Islamic theology, people, some people, they moved away in different times and they started to have, you know, different X, Y, Z faiths. So God, by his mercy and guiding nature, he appointed messengers and prophets to bring these people back again to the fold of Islam. So for that reason, we say all the prophets and all the messengers, they were followers of Islam. So what is the name of a person who follows Islam? You know, just like you have Christianity and then you have Christians as followers. So who are the, what, what are the followers of Islam called? Muslims. There you go, it's easy, right? <laughs> These are so easy questions, right? So Muslims. So we say again that Abraham was a Muslim. And we say Jesus was a Muslim, right? Moses and uh, all the prophets, they were Muslims. So in that sense, even though the book, I'm almost 100% sure, the book may say that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the founder of Islam in the 7th century or so. What we say is that Islam does not have a founder. Islam as a concept, as a guidance was given by God. And that same concept was given to all the prophets. Uh, and then the last prophet was again given that same fundamental belief. Any question or comment on that? This is something new perhaps to all of you. Yes. Is there any, um, like, is there any possibility or any belief that there will be another prophet? Or is like it believed that Muhammad is like the final one? Sure, sure. So the question is, uh, is there a possibility of a belief of maybe one more prophet, right? Or more prophets to come? No, what we say is that Quran is the word of God. So in the Quran, it says in chapter 33, verse number 40 to be exact, that Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is the Khatam al nabin he is the seal of the prophets. No new prophet, no new messenger. But then your question can be, you know, humanity is changing, new problems are coming, right? Guidance is needed, new, uh, new so many, you know, drug abuse and a breakdown of the family structure, racism, gun violence, homicide, suicide where there should be some solutions, maybe a new prophet. What Muslims we say is that anything that is needed by humans for their guidance, it is covered in the Quran 100%. All right. That means Quran does have guidance about what is the purpose of life, who is the creator, what are the solutions to humanity's problems and how to go to paradise. So for that reason, there is no need for a new prophet. There is no need for a new book. Yeah, understand? Yeah, thank you. Very good. So that's kind of the basic, uh, <laughs> you know, history of Islam as we say. And then if you want to know more about from the time of the Prophet up until our time, uh, you know, I will, I will try to wrap up in about five minutes, then you can ask those questions, God willing. All right. So that's one God, right? The M stands for the messengers that God has appointed. And this one is easy because you can see the names of some of them there. So according to Islam, there have been literally thousands of messengers sent to every country and every nation. And they all came with that one fundamental truth, submission to one God. One faith that we say is the only and the original faith that God has given to humanity. All right. And the, all the messengers, they were connected to one God as being a messengers. 
and connected to that one faith, right? And the G stands for the guidance. You know, just like in uh, schools and colleges, there is a study guide. The professor may give notes. There could be a textbook, right? Some links, some resources. So we can excel in the classroom and graduate and move on. So what uh, Islam says is that God as a loving God, as a guiding God, he has given scriptures in the past and now he gave the last scripture or the last guidance and the last study guide. So humanity, we would know how to live our life. You know, just like when all of you, when you got your license, how to drive, there is a rule of the road book, right? Taken out by Illinois, Secretary of State. And that book will help us that the speed limits and the signs and, uh, you know, when to change the lane, when to stop, all the guidance that we need when we drive, we say that is a constitution for how to drive. In a similar way, humanity, we also need a worldwide constitution, how to live our life as brothers and sisters, right? How to eradicate racism and uh, what to eat, how to, what to wear. So we need holistic guidance, not only individual guidance. Islam says that God is going to give us guidance. Also, how to run an efficient political system, economic system, matrimonial, family system, right? Judiciary, penal. For humanity to run efficiently, there has to be a comprehensive system. So what we say is that Quran is that world constitution. It just does not speak about the spiritual aspect of a person. It speaks about how the society, the whole humanity should run on efficient system. So once you read the Quran, you will find like comprehensive guidance in there. So we have two sources of guidance or two sources of uh, our main Islamic beliefs. One is the Quran and the second one is the example of Muhammad peace be upon him. In Arabic, there is a word for that one. I'm not sure if your, if your book covers that. Yes. Uh, say that again. Hadith. Okay, fine, fine. So Hadith are the sayings of Muhammad, peace be upon him. So there is one more word which is called as the Sunnah. Quran and the Sunnah, right? Have you heard the word Sunnah? Maybe? You guys, come on, you guys did, I guess, right? So the Quran is the word of God and Muhammad, peace be upon him, he implemented, he practiced the Quran. So his practices, his example, also form the core belief of Islam where we extract what to do, how to live, right? Who is the creator? So that's where the guidance comes in. And the last important concept is the concept of, okay, you guys take a guess. What do you think H may stand for? You have the life of this world and then you have the life of? What happens after everyone dies, they go somewhere. What if I go for it? The hereafter. the hereafter, right? The hereafter. All right. So this is also a really important belief. Uh, you know, one third of the Quran speaks about the hereafter because this life is like very short life. Hereafter is for eternity. So according to Islamic theology, after everyone dies, there is going to be a day of resurrection and a day of judgment. That means every single human would be brought back to life both in our soul and in our body. So I think that's the difference between the New Testament and the Quran. Both bodily resurrection is also mentioned in the Quran. On that day, you know, just like there is an evaluation at the end of the semester, there is a grand evaluation for every single human in front of God. God would be the one evaluating us, right? Or judging us based upon two important, uh, uh, two important concepts. One would be what kind of belief that you had and what deeds that you have done. So if the person had the right belief, worshipping only the creator, right, not attaching any partners and trying the best to do good deeds, and if they fall short, asking for God's forgiveness. So that's the formula in Islam to go to paradise. So this is mentioned in chapter number 2, verse number 25 to be exact. So God is saying, I'm just giving, I'm just paraphrasing here. If anyone who has the right belief and doing good deeds, God promises those people eternal paradise. On the flip side of it, you know, just in a classroom, if a student 
does not come to class on time or does not participate or do the quizzes, the exam, the assignments, there is going to be consequences. Like any teacher, any professor is going to have consequences for that student. So Islam does believe in the hellfire for those people uh, who associate partners with God and dies like that. Saying that, okay, God is there, we believe in it, him. And uh, then the, this idol, this person, this prophet uh, or this animal, right, is equal to God. So if a person believes in that and dies like that, according to Islam, chapter 4, verse number 116, this is the only unpardonable sin in Islam. You know, just like in the New Testament, there is a ultimate blasphemy. Okay, what is that one? The unforgivable sin, according to the New Testament. It's for you guys. It's a blasphemy to some entity. Who is the third person in the Trinity? The Holy Spirit. Yes. That is the ultimate sin according to the New Testament. According to the Quran, the ultimate sin is committing shirk. Shirk means associating partners with God. If a person does that and dies like that without repenting, without coming back and believing and worshipping one God, this is what leads a person to hellfire. Alright, so that's kind of the formula. And last but not the least, we say that the Quran was given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So he was born, okay, quiz question to you guys. When do you think he was born? Approximately, like which century? Yesterday, yesterday right? <laughs> Long time ago, yeah. right? No, we talked about it yesterday in class. Okay, who wants to help? Uh, Maria, you want to help? When do you think the prophet was born? Uh, I forgot. Okay, Yusuf. When do you think the... Oh, I'm asking my son, right? <laughs> when do you think the prophet was born? Uh, he got it. 570, right? <laughs> you can join, you can join North Park College <laughs> University, right? All right, yeah, good job. 570. So when the Prophet, when he was uh, 40 years of age, in the year 610, uh, Angel Gabriel came to him. He was sent by God and that's when the initial passages of the Quran started to be revealed. So for the next 23 years, until the Prophet passed away in the year 632, Quranic passages and chapters, they came in piecemeal. And then the whole Quran was completed by the year 632, just before the Prophet passed away. So he memorized it and he passed it on to his people. They memorized it and not only people memorized it, when we pray the five daily prayers, we don't have a book in front of us that we read from. It's from the memory that we recall. And as I mentioned, right, there are like literally millions of people right now who memorize the whole Quran. So that's one way the Quran has been preserved. The second way is through writing. See, Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not know how to read and write. So anytime when a passage used to come, he used to call some scribes who knew how to read and write. And they used to write it down in front of him. And the prophet used to ask them, read it back to me what you wrote down just to make sure they wrote down what he was saying. So in that way, the whole Quran was also written down in front of the prophet. So the way that the Quran is preserved is this way. Both in the memory, there have been like multiple chains of memorizers coming from the prophet time all the way to our time, right? 2022. And simultaneously, there are manuscripts going back all the way to the very first century. So the, so the neat way is this. If someone makes a mistake in writing, right, in copying, because of, you know, people are tired, people may not remember what they read last night, right? <laughs> I'm just not picking on you. Uh, because of old age, because of poor light. People make mistakes, we make mistakes even now. So if a manuscript has like one error, the memorizers, they will look at the manuscript because they already know what it should be. They will catch the error, they will correct the error and this manuscript becomes as pure as the original. So in that way, there's a dual check and balance system for the preservation of the Quran. And this preservation of the Quran, there is, a, there is a prophecy in the Quran that God is protecting it. So the Quran would not be changed. 
This is in chapter 15, verse number 9. Inna nahnu nazzalna zikra wa inna lahu lahafizun, right? So the translation is this, it is God who has sent down this message and he is the one who is protecting it. So we say this prophecy is coming true. Okay, and last but not the least, what do you think are the five pillars of Islam? That one is easy, go for it. <laughs> Okay, you can help. Sydney can help and Jose can help. Huh? Okay, believe in one God in, in the messenger of Muhammad, in the messengership of Muhammad, peace be upon him, right? Reciting that, okay. The pilgrimage. The pilgrimage, right? And one more. What did you guys observe there? Prayer. The prayer. So, Shahada is the first one, testimony of faith. That I bear witness, there is no other God besides one God, Allah, and I bear witness, Muhammad is the messenger. That's the first pillar. The second pillar is to pray five times a day. The third pillar is to give the poor due, the charity. right? And the fourth pillar is uh, fasting in the month of Ramadan. And the fifth one is pilgrimage. And the last point I have, uh, Yusuf, you can come. Do you know the six beliefs? Yes? You don't? Okay, who knows the six beliefs of Islam? I want one of the youth to just come. One, two, three, four, five, six. Come on over. They, they're all looking at you. Okay, Yusuf, you can come and then we can help you. All right? Okay. Yusuf, is that all? Come here. You can start. You can say some, then we will all help you. Inshallah, God willing. So Yusuf, mashallah, he just graduated from third, right? Third grade, and he and he goes to this school, and he's one of the children here who memor who's uh, from day until evening they memorize the whole Quran. So Quran has 114 chapters. He finished like what about 60 chapters so far, and it's uh, yeah, alhamdulillah, and it's been only what uh, four months. Yes. So Yusuf. Um, the six beliefs, right? You can mention anyone, then we can help you with more. Um, believe in one God. Okay, believe in one God is one. Okay, five more to go. Uh, and prophets. Yeah, all the prophets. Okay, who is the first prophet and who is the last prophet? Um, prophet Adam. Yeah. Prophet Adam is the first one. And who is the last one? Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, right? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, four more to go. In the books. So what we believe is, we believe in all the books that came to Jesus and Moses and David and uh, Noah and Abraham. Not Noah, well, Noah too. Uh, so what we say is that we believe those books in the original form, not in the current form. So the book that we go to now for guidance is the Quran. Three more to go, right? He said three? Yeah, three more to go. Angel? Yeah, I believe in the angels. All right. Almost there. Two more to go. What happens after people die? Day of judgment. Day of judgment. All right. One more to go. Okay, guys, which one is he missing? Angels. No, angels, he got the angels part. Huh? Yeah, belief in the destiny. destiny. All right, he got all of them, right? <laughs> okay, very good, yes, sir. Go ahead, you can take a seat. All right, good job, right? Not bad, <laughs> alhamdulillah. That's pretty good. So these are the six important beliefs, right? Yes. So again, just to summarize, right? Just to summarize, what we say is that Islam is a comprehensive way of life. <laughs> Not just about worshipping five times a day or once a week or something like that. What we wear, how we interact with the people, Right? Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that you're not a full believer if you eat your full and your uh, neighbors are hungry. What we speak, how we interact with the opposite gender, with, uh, with uh, respect. Right? Uh, there is a way that we should be respecting and honoring and taking care of our parents. In fact, in Islam, there is no such thing as a nursing home. The, the nursing home of the parents is the home of the child. So in that way, Islam is a comprehensive way of life, 
not only transforming a person and families but with that all of humanity so in that we say there is justice there is morality uh, there is unity right away from all the islamophobia anti-semitism racism and all the ills and society is formed which is based upon justice and the outcome is loving peace and that is the message of islam and the message of peace thank you very much thank you Anything thank else? You. Thank you. I think I need to take that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you so yeah, much you for so, so um, much. Yes, thank you your much. lecture and thank you all for being here. Appreciate it much. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this is yeah. really great. Thank and you. we'll come back next semester. Yeah, yeah. So first and foremost, we want to thank the creator who gave us this opportunity. Mm -hmm. So all of us are here, right? Despite different faiths and cultures and nationality and backgrounds, we are all here as children of Adam and as brothers and sisters. So may God guide us, may God bless us. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Take so care. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Yeah. This is wonderful. Appreciate it. Thank you for staying. And back. thanks for all the family.